we can either puff ourselves up and say, why I deserve, or we can bring ourselves low and say, Lord, you have a plan I can't fully see. I am so glad that you have joined us today. Welcome to episode eight of the Devoted Life podcast. I'm your host, Justin Kendrick, and I am just pumped for uh, the conversation today. Every month, we try to give you 30 minutes to ignite your faith, deepen your devotion to Jesus. We release an episode the last Thursday of every month. And so uh, if the content's helpful, help us get the word out. You can subscribe. You can share it on social. Helps us reach more people. Today, I want to invite you to hang with us as we talk about a really, really important topic. And I've got some friends in the studio. The first person is my favorite person on earth, Christina Rose, my bride. Good to have you here, babe. And then the great Dave Callahan is joining us for the podcast. So uh, it's going to be great. You're going to get to know these guys over the course of the episode. But let me set up the conversation. Uh, September 3rd, actually, just uh, just after this comes out, uh, I have got a new book coming out called How to Quiet a Hurricane. We just actually got the author copy in the mail a couple days ago. So really excited to share this. Uh, strategies for Christian endurance in the midst of life's storms. And the reason I'm so excited about this book is I really believe it's going to help you. I believe that God's going to use this content in your life. And uh, and it really what, what it talks about is the, the truth that a storm is coming. And of course, we don't like to think about that in our modern age. We always like to say, well, my life's just going to be easy and perfect. And then when the storm does come, We're blown away. We're shocked. We don't have a plan. We haven't really thought through how to handle the challenges. And a lot of us are falling apart. We're falling apart. We're crumbling and cracking, and we're not prepared for the storms of life. And so a lot of times when people get hit by a storm, they end up losing their faith. You know, I'm sure you're listening to this podcast right now, driving in your car, you're working out. I'm sure you have a friend who has walked away from Jesus, has walked away from faith, has walked away from church because of the storm. Uh, some of us compartmentalize our faith, right? We just don't even think about the suffering or the challenge in light of our faith. We just make two little boxes. I've got my Jesus box and I've got my hurting, broken sorrow box because of the challenges of life. And that is a shallow faith. So you can you can lose your faith, you can compartmentalize your faith, or you can deepen your faith. The challenges and the trials of life can actually become a catalyst for deeper faith and richer faith and uh, more life-giving faith. And so that's what we're going to talk a little bit about today. The title of the book comes from a a story in Mark chapter 4, such an intriguing story. But um, it's the story where Jesus calms the storm, of course, and that storm is actually referred to in Mark 4 as a hurricane gale. And and really the interesting thing about this story is, of course, Jesus' intervention where he quiets the storm, and then he turns to his disciples and he says, where's your faith? as if Jesus intended for his disciples to handle it. And so how do we quiet a hurricane? How do we live a life that rises above the storm and even moves through the storm? And so uh, we'll hit some of the topics that are covered in the book today. And uh, and what I want to say maybe first and foremost is that this is possible, that a lot of times people think that living a life of victory or a life of joy or a life of peace is impossible. And it's not. There's a promise in 2 Thessalonians 3, 5. Paul prays a prayer. He says, may the Lord direct your heart to the love of God and the steadfastness of Christ. And I want you to think about this kind of like two rooms in your heart, that there is an outer room, which is the love of God, that if you're going to endure in this life, you must learn to live in the love of God. But then the inner room, the room that you enter in through the love of God, that room Paul calls the steadfastness of Christ that we can actually access the very endurance of Jesus in our lives. It's not just steadfastness inspired by Christ. It's not just steadfastness to follow Christ. It's the steadfastness of Christ, his very strength alive in you. And so let's flush this out. We're going to talk about it a little bit and uh, and get into some of the topics of the book. But Dave, I'll start with you. Um, Our friendship really went a whole lot deeper on July 7, 2017. And that's the day that you um, you heard the news that your son, Ben, who was 10 years old, had drowned in a swimming accident. Of course, this is like, you know, in in the life of an individual, one of the most challenging uh, trials that any parent could, any human could ever imagine walking through. And for the next uh, few months, I got a front row seat to your process. 
and watched as you and your family, you grieved, you mourned. Um, and then I think you stunned a lot of people because you didn't lose hope. Um, you did grieve, you did mourn. It wasn't that you didn't do those things, but through it all, uh, you know, you reminded me probably more than anyone I've ever met of what, what Paul says when he says, we do not grieve as the world does. Yes, we grieve, but we do not grieve as the world does. And I, I think, I think for parents, um, wow, that's, that's a miraculous thing, man. That is a miraculous thing. And so I just, I, uh, when I, as soon as I thought about how to quiet a hurricane and, and having a conversation about processing the challenges of life, I thought, man, I've got to, I've got to talk to Dave on this episode. And so, you know, um, you're not a stranger to challenging and hard times. I know you've lost a close friend, you've lost your mom. So this is not, this is not something, you know, that is new for you, but, but as you processed, um, the, the loss of your son, um, let's just talk a little bit about it. Where have you turned now in seven years and you guys have, I've, I've really watched you for seven years, like so miraculously, honorably, deeply, uh, honor God, honor Ben and, um, and trust Jesus. Um, let us into that process. What comes into your mind when I, when I mentioned that? Well, when the boys were little, we had one of these CDs that we put in remember CDs yes, to put them CDs. in the car as they were driving around with kids songs and Bible, Bible songs. And there were songs that I'd, I'd even sung as a child. Yeah. You know, the wise man builds his house upon the rock. And, yes. And setting that firm foundation. And uh, we sang that over and over and over so many times. And as much as it ingrains it into the kids, right. it also becomes a part of like mm -hmm. what we need to know. And those children's songs can be so simple. Like, yeah. It's so fundamental and really helps like solidify the things in your heart that you need to know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Coming home that day. We had a we had a five or six hour wait in between the time that Ben went missing and the time that they came and they told us that they had found his body. Yeah. Um, and so that time was a very intentional time for our family. Paul and I went in the backyard and we prayed. And I think it's critical to not ever let prayer be a last resort. Mm. Um, I was huge. I was so so privileged to grow up in an environment where if I came downstairs in the morning. I knew my dad was going to be reading his Bible. Mm. And I knew my mom would be in the other room reading her Bible, taking notes. I mean, she was like really amazing, journaling. Wow. Um, and so it was just understood that that was part of life. That was part of growing up. And that was where your foundation was. And when something went wrong, we so instantly want to flip out or we so instantly want to cry and be crazy. But it was, have you prayed about this yet? Wow. And so, I mean, from like a really young age, you know, and not everybody gets that privilege. And yep. so- I just I'm so thankful to my parents for creating that environment. Uh, and you do that, man. Like you're, I think maybe more than anyone I know, you have an instinct towards prayer, you know, um, which is a pretty rare thing. Yeah. As you guys look over, and I've watched you do a lot of different things, but as you look over these last seven years, um, you've done such a good job of, of celebrating Ben's life. And even, I remember early on, the language you would use, I was, I was so blessed by it because you're like, man... Um, I trust God that Ben, that Ben fulfilled his assignment and, and, uh, the timing of God is a mystery to us. Um, but I trust him. Um, just, just getting to that place of trust. What has that looked like for you? There was a picture that really floored me and I'll try to get through this. So I can't emotional. Yeah. Um, and it's a picture that someone sent me right after, right after we were becoming a family of an earthly family of four. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's a picture of Jesus reaching down, but it's from underwater. Mm -hmm. And so it's got all of the ripples, which you would see if your eyes were open mm -hmm. underwater. Yep. Picture of Jesus reaching down. Uh, and just to know that that was what Ben saw. Wow. was so powerful for us. And it's, you know, we'd just been through losing my mom the year before. Yes. And the kids were little. Yes. And there was three, my brother has three girls. I have the three boys. And... We went through that process, and it was, how do you teach kids that are six, seven, eight, and nine at the time? And, you know, what, is it, what does it look like for someone to not be here on earth anymore? Right. And death is separation. The word death means separation. It's not, you, you, your ideas can die, your, your career can die, right. your dreams can die. All those things can die. It just means you separate from them yep. as opposed to the, the absence of soul. Mm -hmm. So if you look at it as a separation and you really buy into the fact that 
we are not the center of this story. That's I am not the center of this story. Oh, and it's, it's huge. It's the most unbelievable thing. We talk about idolatry and we talk about uh, the way that people worship things. Yes. And we worship self more than any other culture has ever been. Yes. Wow. And we make ourselves the center of the universe. And why did this happen to me? It okay. happens when when my thing doesn't go the way you right. And if you turn around and you start to separate it and you look at it from who is God and the fact that it's his story. Like we're in history and it's our little itty bitty piece yeah. of his story. Mm. And if you look at it and start to realize the, the breadth of what he's doing and the fact that you're this cool little part of it that yes. he's invited you into fellowship with him as a as a as a co-worker in it. Um, it changes your outlook. And we just had baptisms last week. Yeah. And not everybody gets the chance to say, I'm going to fight through something. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to work with Jesus and get to see the results. So few people actually get to see the results. It's true. The baptisms that happened in, I believe it was September of 2017. Yeah. We remember that. We got to see people say, because of the way the Callahans have relied on their faith. Yes. I am not being baptized. I know. It's crazy. So you don't get to see that yeah. most of the time to have someone actually yeah. out in front and say, this matters. Yeah. And Ben now has spiritual children. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And spiritual grandchildren. Yeah. Yep. That's like, that gets you through because if you see God in that big view, if you see him where you're serving with him, <laughs> that is sets the tone for how you should react to everything yes. that happens in life. Wow. And man, this might not be the worst thing that ever happens to me. And God used that and anything that comes along now that's not what I want. Can I turn around and, and it sounds so cliche yeah. because it's in the Lord's prayer and not my will, but your will. Yeah, and it yeah. has to be that part of it. Yeah. yeah. Then you look at it in a setting of God, you're in control. I'm mm. yep. yeah. And that allows you to get, you don't get through. You don't ever, you don't ever get over it. That's right. Time doesn't heal. Time yeah. creates scars. Like yeah. you don't ever, as a person, as a dad, I'll never be over mm-hmm. losing my buddy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But it's a short period of time until we see him again. Yes. In yes. that view. Gold, gold. This is, uh, listen, I mean, this is just the testimony that um, there is nothing in this life stronger than Jesus. You know, um, that, that, you know, we have lived in a mirage, friends. Let me just burst the bubble, right? The American Christian ethic that says, hey, if you follow Jesus, nothing bad will ever happen to you. Friends, read the book. That is not the case, right? The book is full of things, tragedies, trials, difficulties, struggles, losses, injustices, and God making his face known through them. And so... um Wow, what a testimony uh, to the way the Lord works! And um, in the book, there's a there's a chapter that is maybe the closest one to my heart. It's called the weakness paradox, and it's it's uh, it talks about the fact that uh, we get stronger and stronger in Jesus as we see ourselves weaker and weaker without Him. And uh, such an important idea. And babe, I want to turn to you for a minute. Obviously, Paul addresses this directly in Second Corinthians twelve. When the Lord speaks to Paul and says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And then he says, therefore, I'm going to boast in my weakness. And one of the things that I've gotten to watch you do over the course of 20 plus years is lean into those moments of humility, that um, that the circumstances of life, uh, just actually exactly what Dave just said, you know, it, <laughs> we can either puff ourselves up and say why I deserve, or we can bring ourselves low and say, Lord, you have a plan I can't fully see. And I trust you. And a lot of times our inability to process pain and sorrow and loss and trial is actually evidence of our pride. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and, uh, and so, um, how, talk to me about weakness. How has weakness for you become a doorway to strength? Um, as you think about that idea. Yeah. I think it's, it's important to acknowledge that we live in a culture where we're actually really afraid of being weak, of of admitting a weakness that like as, as a culture, that's not something you want to acknowledge or admit in your own life. Whereas within the context of Christianity, there's actually a celebration to be had right. within our weakness, right. right? And so I think when I look at, at my own life and different seasons that I have walked through, I think about that verse in Romans 2 where it talks about the kindness 
that leads us to repentance, right? And yeah. so repentance, like, so that turning away. And I, right. I feel like in I've experienced the love of Jesus in the same way in admitting my own weakness towards him as I have repentance of sin, right? Acknowledging my need for him. Yep. It's really the root is the same, yep. right? I need forgiveness of sin. Yeah. That comes from the grace of the cross of Christ, but I also need his strength made perfect in me, so I have to acknowledge my need for him. And so I think about um, Dane Orland in his book, Gentle and Lowly, talks about that it is our need that endears the heart of Christ toward us. So that place of our weakness, that place of our brokenness, that's that's actually what causes Christ to draw closer to us. And so the quicker I can admit my need, Mm. the quicker I become, my heart becomes entwined with the heart of Christ. And so when I am suffering, when I am in need, when I experience lack, everything that I actually long for is found in him. And that's not just like a platitude or a cliche thing. It's the reality of knowing God, right? And so I have found this like weird, (laughs) this weird thing in me that I like hunt out my weaknesses. Sure. I hunt down my sin, anything that would cause separation between me and the Lord, because I don't want to be far from him. I want to be close to him and knowing that that's actually his heart for me. Yeah. It is, it has, is life changing really. Yeah. So. Yeah. You know, I think so many people misunderstand the Christian life, you know, and, and like, we think it's like, let me prove that I'm strong so that God tells me how good I am. Right. right? And like the Christian life is actually that Jesus has proved that he's strong so that he can reveal how good he is through you. And so, you know, just this idea of like learning to start from a place of brokenness with God. I really believe, friends, hear this today. That is the beginning of strength. That is really the beginning of strength. There's that one little phrase in um, in the Song of Solomon, which is a whole nother podcast for another day, right? But there's this one line where the bride, she says, I am very dark, but lovely. And like that, that is like to me where all maturity and endurance begin, because it's this revelation that, yes, I'm broken. Yes, I'm weak. I'm very dark. And yet I'm lovely to God. Like he loves me. And it's from that frame that now the strength of God can start to live inside of you. And so I just encourage you, these are these are real ideas. These are real strategies for endurance, okay? Um, in the book, one of the most important sections, it, it, probably for me the most important section, is uh, where I get into suffering, a theology of suffering. And of course, we're already talking about this, but I, I think a lot of Christians never develop a theology of suffering. And so, you know, the theology of suffering is avoid it and hope for the best. And the chapter's called Walking Through the Fire. And I talk a little bit about, in the book, I, t- I write about um, the, the three... Uh, Babylonian slaves, right? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And when they face Nebuchadnezzar in the fire, and they give this answer, I want to read their answer. Of course, Nebuchadnezzar, if you don't know the story, Daniel chapter 3 commands these young boys to bow down and worship a a golden idol, and uh, they won't do it. And they say this in verse 17. They say, if we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you've set up. I've read that a lot of times as a kid, you know, uh, heard this story. It's one of the kind of famous ones. But that it always puzzled me a little bit because it's kind of a weird way to respond, right? It's like they say three things, and those three things don't seem to fit together. But friend, I want to tell you, they are the foundation for a theology of suffering. Mm -hmm. And they are simply this. The first, God is able, okay? This is a declaration of his power that he is sovereign, that he's over all, that he is able. That's the first thing. But the second thing is God is willing. This is the theology of his goodness, that he's a good God, that he doesn't bring pain and hardship and suffering. That comes from a fallen, broken world. And yet at the same time, this third piece where they say, first they say he's able, then they say he will deliver us, and then they say, but even if he does not. And that part sounds like they're backtracking, but what they're, what they're talking about is God is wise, that he has a providential, mysterious plan that we can't fully see. And so a theology of suffering is these three things coming together. I believe in a God of power who is able. I believe in a God who's good and is willing. And I believe in a God of wisdom whose plan I can't always discern. And all three of those things coming together in what look like contradictions actually become like a fabric 
for handling suffering so that you're not saying, well, God can't be good if he let this happen. No, he's, he's wise in ways we can't understand and don't see. Well, then he can't be powerful if he let this happen. No, he has all power and ability uh, to control all things in this universe. It's all in his hand. And so what happens is when these things get into you and really begin to, to build into the way you see the world, uh, it does create the capacity not just for endurance, but actually joy, peace, and hope in the midst of sufferings. Dave, let's talk about that a little bit. Those three ideas, God is able, God is willing, God is wise. Uh, how have those played out in your life? Do you think about those? Huge topic, of course. But. Huge topic. Huge topic. Uh, in 10 seconds or less. No, I'm just kidding. Take as much time as you want. Uh, there, there's never been a doubt in my mind that that God is for us. Mm. That's all throughout Scripture. Yes. Um, and that the the willing part, I think, is the hardest part for us because we pray for yeah. things all the time. Right. And we and we think yes answers are God showing that he's right. willing. Right. God loves me because he said yes. Mm-hmm. And... You know, having had little kids, little kids want lollipops all day. Right. And if you give them lollipops all day, they can turn out to be a mess. And I right. harassed my children for years with making them eat ground meat and vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> you sure did. These poor little kids. They were doing dumbbell snatches at three years old. <laughs> um, and if you, if God were to give in to us and give us everything that we wanted, he would have a, a world full of spoiled brats calling themselves Christians, and it wouldn't be a real reflection of who he is. Yes. And so the willingness is willing us to be more like him, willing us to be ready to work with him in the kingdom, ready to be administrators in heaven. We don't know how heaven's going to look. We don't know who there's going to be some kind of economy. There's going to be some kind of work to do, and you're going to love your work, and you're going to be involved, and you're going to be engaged. But we don't know how that looks yet. Yep. And so he wants to prepare us for that process and some people like the guys like the guy on the cross next to him he's gonna have any kind of preparation right he's gonna come in with fair bone to say believed you were god and that's it yep and then there are people who have the opportunity to work for for decades yes and really fulfill the things that god has wanted them to do and when they get to heaven he's beyond the well done good and faithful servant He's going to say, and look at this cool job I've prepared yes. for you because yes. now you're ready. Yep. Now you're prepared. And that's the willing part. How how frequently it, it's not even that God is willing, mm-hmm. but we have to be willing to allow him to hand it to us. Yeah. So good. So And so the wisdom that we develop to be more like him mm-hmm. is because he knows the things that we don't know. Yes. And we have to pray. In such a way that it's, God, if I knew what you know, oh, that's I would be asking for yeah. this. And so a lot of times you leave it open-ended and you don't finish the prayer. God, I want you to f- help me finish this thing by doing Right, right, that. right. Yep. And if we can remove ourselves from the control, again, making ourselves the center, yep. then we can experience his willingness. We can experience his wisdom. And that allows us to experience I love what Dallas Willard said, where it's similar to what you just said, just that all you take with you is your character, you know, that like, hey, the money doesn't come, you know, the appearance, you know, will be transformed. You'll have a new body uh, made from the ashes of your old body. Uh, but what you do take with you is all the character you developed or didn't develop in this life. Yeah. And um, wood, hay and stubble burns, but the gold, it comes. Uh, Baby, as you think about these three ideas, God is willing, God is able, God is wise. As a foundation for processing loss, pain, walking through fire, what comes to mind? Yeah. So it's interesting because I think that there is a compounding nature to having a deeply rooted trust in Jesus. And yep. I mean, I look back, even David, like reflecting on that season for your family, like watching you guys did not cling to Christ in the way that you did out of desperation. You did it out of discipline. You had already disciplined your heart to fully trust in the character and the nature of God, in what you could not see, in what you could not understand, right? And so I I look even in my own life um, and find that for me, there is like this daily discipline aspect of giving to God what I can see in my life that I need to trust him with Mm -hmm. so that when there are seasons where I don't know what's coming next, my heart is already disciplined toward trusting that he's able and that he's willing, that he's wise. 
otherwise. Oh, so good. like I have this this seashell right now I keep on my vanity in my bathroom and yeah. it's called my don't worry shell. I found it a couple weeks ago on vacation and it's just this, it's a very picturesque little shell. It's very pretty to look at, but it's there to remind me of like, what do I need to give to the Lord today yeah. to trust him that he's willing and that he's able wow. and that he's wise so that when, not if, but when those seasons or situations in my life come where I don't see the other side, I don't have an explanation for what it is that I'm walking through. It's outside of my human understanding. I, my, my default is I trust the Lord. Yeah. I trust his nature. I trust his character. I trust who he is and his love for me. Yeah. Training your heart. That's so good. I've been reading, uh, an autobiography of John Patton. Not too many people know who he is. He was a Scottish missionary off the coast of Australia in the late 1800s. And, um, I mean, this guy, his wife dies on the mission field. Then his baby boy dies shortly after that. Then his partner in ministry is killed by the natives and eaten and on and on and on. I mean, it's like the most terrible story. And this guy spends his life reaching these unreached people groups on this tiny little set of islands. And hundreds of them end up coming to Christ. It's still a primarily Christian community today, much much because of John Patton. Like, he, he literally changed this region with the gospel. But there's this one part in his autobiography where he is running through the jungle being chased by uh, natives with spears who are trying to kill him. I mean, it's like crazy stuff. And he says, in that moment, as I'm running, it dawns on me. And he says, he even begins to smile and laugh. And he says, um, man is immortal until his work on earth is done. Mm -hmm. yep. And that thought is just liberation mm -hmm. in the midst of suffering and trial. That there is a God who has a plan I can't see, a purpose I don't know, but whether I live five years, 10 years, or 100 years, it's just a tiny little drop in the great ocean of eternity. And so I'm going to serve his purpose now, and I'm immortal till my work on earth is done. Wow. And that is such a powerful way to live our lives. And, um, and really, just, just the understanding that so many of us are not operating that way, uh, that was kind of the inspiration behind this book. And hopefully, uh, this gives you some real handles to say, okay, how can I quiet hurricanes? How can I face storms? Uh, how can I overcome and actually live a life of stability and have an inner framework that doesn't crumble and crack? This is the point, friends. It's going to happen. There will be challenges. There will be trials. If you're not prepared, just like you said, babe, beforehand, they will blow you over. And so um, I just encourage you, be intentional. Be intentional about developing a deep inner framework for endurance now in your life. And um, and you take that character with you. You take it into eternity. Um, as you both look back over some of the dark moments, let me ask you a question just to wrap this up today. What would you say to someone who finds themselves right now in one of those moments, um, one of those dark moments, one of those moments, uh, what would you say uh, to them? Dave, you go ahead and go first. Well, you... You can't have victory if you're not in a fight. So no, that's good. Um, if if you're a believer and the devil isn't coming after you and he's not giving you a hard time, then you don't scare him. Yep. Uh, so if you're not being challenged, you need to dig in more. You need to share your faith more. You need Come to. On. You need to be a little bit more Christ-like. Mm -hmm. And if you are in the midst of the battle, just like. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, like, he can, he will, and even if he does. Yeah, yeah. You you got that house. If you built your house on the rock, your foundation is firm. The floods can rise, and they and they will, and your foundation will stand firm. Mm. And so it's building that now, and, um, yeah, it's just, it's that devoted life of prayer first. Yeah. Wow. So good. Babe, what comes to mind? Yeah, I think I would say what I have had to remind myself of many, many times over is that trusting God is worth it. Yeah. It's worth it that his character will prove true every single time. Yeah. And so every day or every moment, sometimes it is that moment by moment that I need to reiterate my trust in his character and in who he is, binds my heart to his in a way that then his love for me becomes the foundation of my life mm -hmm. that I can build everything on. And so uh, like we talked about that that old Christian kid song, right? Yeah. Like where I am rooting yes. myself, that yes. firm foundation of his love, when that is like where I'm rooting my hope is in the perfect love of Christ for me. Mm. Then what? Yeah, what? so good. May the Lord direct your heart to the love of God and the steadfastness of Christ. You can live 
with the steadfastness of Christ himself. You can operate from the endurance of Jesus. Not just endure because Jesus inspired you. Not just endure because Jesus is with you. He is, but actually live from his strength in you. It's real. It's possible. It's available. I just encourage you, if uh, if the content of today's podcast maybe inspired you a little bit, pushed you a little bit, make sure you like it. Make sure you subscribe it. Make sure you get it out there. We want to reach as many people as we possibly can. Thanks so much for joining us, guys. Thanks for hanging out today for, for the Devoted Life Podcast. And I just want to, everybody listen, keep leaning in, keep trusting Jesus, keep giving him your best. You will never regret a moment. God bless. Switch it.